We got another packed episode of Dollars and Cents for y'all this morning. Uh, A bunch of different topics. We're going to talk about some of the early perspectives, early insights that we're getting this tax season as we begin the process of reviewing our clients' completed tax return. So you're going to want to listen to that because chances are there's probably a way to save money in there as well. We'll also talk about your credit score, what goes into it, what goes into that magical, mystical number, and how might you be able to improve it? My goodness, that credit score drives a lot of different things, and the better your credit score, let's face it, the more money you are going to save when you either borrow money or get insurance or even want to rent a place. So, All of that on the show, plus we'll also try and unravel the mystery that is your required minimum distribution. What is it? How do you calculate it? When is it required? All of those things on this week's edition of Dollars and Cents. So welcome on into the program where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your uh, dollars. We're one of Central Florida's longest running radio programs coming to you on a host of radio stations throughout the Central Florida region. Also happen to be one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the big wide world of web I think I might have said that wrong. Elv isn't really necessary in there, is it? Anyway, check us out on your favorite podcast platform. Any trouble finding us, including on our YouTube channel, well, go to our website, nelsonfinancialplanning.com. Look for the icons. You'll see them there. Click on the one that looks most familiar to you, and you will get immediately connected on over to our channel on whatever platform it is that you're looking for us on. Once you're there, make sure you subscribe because then that way you won't have to do all of that again, right? My name is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning, where we got a team of great folks who also happen to be certified financial fiduciaries as well. They stand ready, willing, and able to help you improve your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan. So it's certainly early in tax season, but there's a few key themes, if you will, that are emerging. And we wanted to spend the first part of the program sort of talking about them because that's great if you were kind of an early bird and you maybe maybe you've even got your taxes all done, but for the vast majority, you still got kind of two months of struggle, if you will, in terms of putting them together and getting them prepared. And of course, as you know, if you're a longtime listener to the program or maybe you're a client of the firm at Nelson Financial Planning, you know that our office completes about 600 tax returns in a season. So we got a pretty extensive tax department, uh, includes four different full and part-time CPAs, plus an IRS enrolled agent. Uh, So vast experience, our focus obviously is on retirees or folks that are close to retiree. It's a very specialized area that we're focusing on. And the reason for that is that that's where it really matters because once you get to retirement, right, it's about what you get to keep and what you get to spend, not necessarily what that top line number is. So how do you minimize that amount that goes to Uncle Sam? Where do you take money from? All, you know, in terms of the types of accounts, how do you become tax efficient in that retirement income? And I guess that's one of the things that makes us unique at Nelson Financial Planning is we actually do the tax form. We actually do the tax preparation services as part of our financial planning company. And so what that means is that you're going to get a much more accurate insight into what exactly is going on and how really you can be tax efficient. I know a lot of firms out there talk about it, but very few have 
the tax department that we have and have the ability to actually complete the return as part of your overall financial plan. A lot of people just punt it and say, oh, you know, look, look at the fine print. It says go consult your tax advisor. Well, don't you want your investment recommendations to be consistent with the proper tax strategy? Anyway, we digress. It's early in the season. Here are four key concepts that we're seeing, key trends that we really think bear a lot of attention. The first one has to deal with tax withholding. You've got to get your tax withholding right, folks, because there is a cost. And this is something we've been talking about for the better part of the past year, sort of warning people or preparing people, because when interest rates go up, so too does the interest cost that the IRS charges you when you owe money on your return. The current cost or the current interest cost that the IRS is charging is 8%. Pretty steep, right? So, one of the things that we started talking about a year ago was seeing this trend. See, in the past, when interest rates were 2%, maybe people didn't care as much. There was still a cost, but maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. At 8%, it starts to be a little bit more significant. So you really want to be taking a look at your tax return and make sure that you're not paying. There's a line item on your tax return that talks about how much extra costs that you are incurring in the form of interest on your tax return. Take a look at that line. It says interest. If there's a bunch of dollars there, then you probably want to certainly change your tax withholding because again, at 8%, that interest cost is getting bigger and bigger. So you really need to look at things like trying to fix that tax withholding, maybe on your paycheck, maybe that's part of uh, starting to withhold tax on your social security, because remember that is taxable folks. And uh, well, above a certain income threshold, but the income thresholds are pretty low these days. Or uh, maybe if you're taking money out of your individual retirement account to adjust the tax withholding on that. A lot of ways in which you can adjust the tax withholding. You can also do the usual quarterly tax payments, but a lot of people don't really like that because that just requires you to you know, remember one more thing in life. And so if you do the regular tax withholding, whether it's on your Social Security or your W-2 or your IRA withdrawals, well, then it sort of gets taken care of along the way. And you don't have to make that extra effort for uh, to make that quarterly tax deposit. So bottom line, if you owe, make sure you check that interest line. If you're paying a bunch of interest, you got to get on top of it. You got to adjust that, adjust that tax withholding because there's clearly a cost more so now than anything that we've seen for probably the past 20 years because of how high interest rates are. And the IRS charges prevailing interest rates. So when interest rates are high, you're going to pay more of a cost. You're going to pay extra money when in when you owe above and beyond what you actually owed. So that's theme number one. Check that tax withholding because the interest cost is starting to get up there pretty good. Number two is I think every year there seems to be a, a greater familiarity with qualified charitable distributions, QCDs as they're affectionately referred to in the financial world. The reality is that it, they have been around for a number of years, but the word hasn't necessarily spread as, as fast as it should have. Interestingly, we're seeing where more and more people are starting to recognize that as a valuable tool to reduce your taxes. It's certainly something that we've been talking about on this program for many years. Here's how it works. So let's assume that you've got a required minimum distribution. So you're, you've got to take money out of a retirement account. What the qualified charitable distribution does is it allows you to take that money and send it directly to charity. And that offsets the entire amount of that as income on your tax return. We're going to take a break. We're going to unpack this one a little bit more when we return after the break here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. 
Talking about some of the th emerging themes that we're seeing as we roll through the review of our client tax returns at Nelson Financial Planning. The theme that we talked about before the break uh, was this notion of tax withholding. Folks, you got to get the tax withholding right. If you owe a bunch of money to the IRS, you are paying interest, and that interest cost is at 8%. Check out your tax return. There's a line that says interest right above the amount, uh, right below the amount that says how much tax you owe. Uh, that's extra money that you can avoid by adjusting your tax withholding. So you really want to take a look at that. It matters more now than it ever used to, uh, looking back over the past really two decades, because of how high interest rates are. The IRS charges the prevailing interest rate when you owe money to them. So check that out. Make sure you make those adjustments to avoid that cost. The second thing that we were talking about just before the break, qualified charitable distributions. This one, the good news is that it seems like more and more people are recognizing the value of this. Here's how it works. You've got a required minimum distribution on your retirement account if you are at least age 73 or more. Now, most charitable contributions wind up not actually making a difference on your tax return, particularly since over 90% of the population now takes the standard deduction. If you remember a few years back, there was a big change in the tax code and the standard deduction went up by quite a bit. For a joint, on a joint return, married couple, two people over 35, it's like over $30,000 in terms of the standard deduction. So you really don't have a spot where you can write off those charitable contributions. And even uh, this year, well, it used to be the year before where you could write off uh, either $300 or $600 regardless. Uh, that option to write uh, those amounts off is completely gone. So you don't even have that option. But what you have with the qualified charitable distribution is the ability to make a donation to a charity and then have that amount completely offset and not be reported as taxable income when you're taking money out of, of a retirement account. Now, here's the caveat. You've got to make sure that the check is made payable directly to the charitable institution. That's the big thing, because if you have the, your required minimum distribution come to you, you put it in your bank account, you turn around, write the check to charity. Folks, that's not going to count. There is a process that you must observe when you're trying to take advantage of qualified charitable distributions. But my goodness, really a great opportunity. And the neat thing about it is it also reduces your income. So if you're one of those folks that is getting bumped uh, up in terms of the cost of your Medicare, because at certain income levels, you have to pay more for your Medicare. And people often uh, come to us and ask the question, well, why did my Social Security get reduced? And the answer is it wasn't your Social Security that was getting reduced. It was your, that your Medicare cost was going up. If you do the QCDs, you can bring yourself down out of that because that means that that income doesn't count as part of your adjusted gross income. So qualified charitable distributions, we've been talking about them for years, can't say enough about them. We're really starting, though, the good news is to see more and more people take advantage of them. And if you're charitable minded and you're, you have a required minimum distribution, my goodness, you really got to look into that as a great tax efficient way to not just donate to charity, but also to reduce your income and correspondingly, your tax bill. Uh, number three, and th this one kind of, I guess, went away or, or maybe wasn't as lucrative as it was. Um, and, and what we're talking about here is, is energy tax credits. Uh, th and they're back. Uh, and the reality is that they sort of really were not very valuable for a number of years. Previously, there was like a lifetime cap of, of, a, of a $500 tax credit that you could do. So once you used up, once you claim the credit, you could never, ever again in the course of your lifetime claim an energy or a residential energy tax credit for when you're putting in a new AC unit or windows or doors or whatever the case may be. $500 lifetime cap, that was the old rule. And it was further limited to be just 10% of that cost. So if, you're, if your um, new windows cost you $3,000, well, then you would only get $300 of that credit because again, limited to 10% of cost. So 
That was the old regime, if you will. Uh, under the new rules for these residential energy credits, they become much more expansive. Okay, so for a while, it seemed like they had sort of disappeared, particularly with that lifetime cap. Now, the new rules allow you to do $1,200 per year. And again, this is a tax credit. So here's the value of a tax credit. It directly dollar for dollar reduces my tax bill. Tax credits always better than tax deductions because they just reduce the income. Still got to use that income number to run it through the tax grinder. A tax credit, meanwhile, reduces your actual tax bill. So these are pretty valuable uh, deductions or tax credits that you can have on your tax return relating to residential energy. So the new rules, $1,200 per year, up to you can include up to 3, 30% of the costs. Now, you, you have to, as with anything, right, with the IRS, there's, there's you know, subset of rules on this. You, you have to observe some of the categorical limitations. And by that, we mean that, okay, so you can do $1,200 per year, but only 600 of that could be used towards uh, the cost of an AC unit or a water heater or something like that. Only 600 of that uh, could be used for windows or skylights or, you know, those kinds of things. And only 250 of the, that uh, per door up to 500 can be used for, for doors. So know that there's different subcategories depending upon what you're doing, AC units, windows, or doors. Each one of them has a very different limit. The overall limit, $1,200. But the good news is, well, first of all, $1,200 is more than 500. So that's good number one. But it it's not a lifetime cap like the old rule was. 500 bucks during the course of your lifetime, that's pretty limited. This is $1,200 per year. Uh, and of course, uh, as you might well expect, uh, you still have those vehicle energy credits out there. Uh, if you're regular to the program, you know that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Kristen Cayley, our in-house uh, CPA, who's also a certified financial planner and certified financial fiduciary as well, joined us, talked a lot about these electric vehicle credits. Um, th the reality is you got to be make sure that your, your purchase is on the list of what's eligible for that tax credit. Make sure you meet those requirements. It also has to have final assembly in the U.S. It has to have a you know, certain uh, sales price below a certain level. And nowadays, there's also some income limits for you in order to claim those credits. But certainly great to see the, the energy tax credits for kind of the normal stuff, right? The ACs, the windows, the doors coming back. We kind of saw that disappear because people would get their $500 tax credit and that's it. That's all they could do for the rest of their life. Now it is $1,200. So that's an interesting theme as well that we're seeing uh, emerge. The last one, and again, this is kind of that same vein of uh, the qualified charitable distributions where uh, a health savings accounts have been around for a long, long period of time. Uh, and, and it just, you know, you have to, in order to have a health savings account, you got to have what is known as a high deductible insurance plan. And for whatever reason, it just wasn't as widely offered. I think there was some concern over what exactly the high deductible part meant, how high is high. And so in order to have an HSA, though, you got to have it paired with a qualified high deductible uh, health insurance policy. And so for many years, we didn't really see a lot of usage of health savings accounts. But now we're really starting to see that uptick as well, much like that qualified charitable distribution. And the neat thing about it is that with a health savings account, we're talking about one of the most powerful savings vehicles that is available to you bar none. Why? Because a health savings account, you get a tax deduction for it. The money grows tax deferred. And when you use it for medical expenses, it's tax free. Not many types of accounts out there that exist that allow you for that triple combination of tax savings. So if you have access to a health savings account, make sure you check into it as an option under your employer benefits. The good news is we're certainly seeing much greater utilization of health savings accounts as they become a little bit more widely available, as people sort of understand a little bit more about what uh, they are all about. So we encourage you as you start to look through the benefits that your employer offers to look to see, do they have a health savings account? And is that something that 
makes sense for me to do. Certainly from a tax perspective and a savings perspective, pretty valuable stuff. Well, we're going to take a break. When we return after these messages, we're going to talk about trying to unpack the mystery that is the required minimum distribution. Coming up next here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. Required minimum distribution. The mysterious requirement that you have to take money out of retirement accounts at certain ages and in certain circumstances. What's it all mean? We're going to try and unpack that on this segment of Dollars and Cents. So welcome on into the program. This, of course, is Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. My name is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning, where we got a great team of folks who stand ready, willing, and able to help you improve your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan. Speaking of mysteries, is it is it just me or like like every day there's like some different unique holiday so around the office we were talking about this that this concept this past week and lo and behold friday was national dog biscuit appreciation day i kid you not okay that's supposedly what it was. And so the breadth of the holidays that are out there really is kind of, I guess, one of life's big mysteries, but we leaned into it. So if you check out our social media, our, our Nelson Financial Planning Facebook or Instagram or Twitter accounts, you'll see some pictures of dogs that are near and dear to the hearts of some of the folks at Nelson Financial Planning enjoying National Dog Biscuit Appreciation Day while simultaneously either reading our book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents, or listening to our Nelson Financial Planning podcast. I even got one of my dogs to sit for the picture, but it was a little tricky. I had to, I had to like uh, uh, put a little um, peanut butter on the cover of the book in order to get a nice picture of him kind of licking the book like he likes the book but reality is i had to put peanut butter on him to get him to do it anyway it's all fun we encourage you to check that out on our social media channels and if you missed it it's not too late you can still give a dog best to your dog or a dog that you know anyway uh the requirement of a distribution um it, it, let's start with a little bit of a conversation about what exactly it is as the name suggests as required minimum distribution, there is a requirement to take out a certain minimal amount out of uh, retirement accounts once you get to a certain age. So, or, or, big caveat here, or if you inherit a retirement account as well. We're going to now break it down into two different parts. So, it's you, it's your retirement account, the age at which that required minimum distribution kicks in right now it's age 73 so it's it's the year in which you turn age 73 so if you're turning age 73 during the course of this year 2024 then guess what you've got a required minimum distribution that you must take out of that retirement account if you think forward uh, to the year 2020, 2033, they're actually going to raise that 73 up to age 75. So if you were born after 1958, so in 1959 and going forward, your required minimum distribution age is going to be 75. So my required minimum distribution age, I was born after 1959, my required minimum distribution age is going to be 75. On the flip side of it, if you inherit a retirement account, then you have just 10 years in which to take that money out, report, and pay the taxes on the entirety of that retirement account. So the, the little caveat here is that if required minimum distributions had already started on that particular account, you've got to continue some baseline level of required minimum distributions based on your life expectancy and still accomplish that full withdrawal over the next 10 year period of time. If required minimum distributions had not started on that particular account, retirement account that you just inherited, then you can wait and you have maximum flexibility. But regardless, you still have to take all of the money out 
and uh, pull it out of that retirement account so that ultimately the taxes are getting paid. And I guess that's the next part of the conversation. Why do we have this requirement? Well, it should be somewhat obvious. Um, we have a required minimum distribution from retirement accounts because the money that is sitting in there has never been taxed, right? If you put money in on a pre-tax basis, that wasn't taxed. The money uh, that's been sitting there that's been growing has all been growing on a tax deferred basis. So all of that growth has never been taxed. So the genesis of the required minimum distribution is to sort of get to that, meaning that you got all these dollars that haven't been taxed, and this is the mechanism where the folks in Washington sort of force you to pay up the taxes on uh, them. Uh, folks in Washington sort of certainly need the money, uh, and uh, that's the concept of making sure that that required minimum distribution uh, comes into play. Of course, as we've said before on the program, if you have an in inherited a retirement account, then the requirement to pay those taxes and to not have that money continue to sit on a tax deferred basis is much more accelerated than it ever has been. You've only got that 10 year window. So, so now we know what it is. Now we know when, how, where, to, when it applies, who it applies to, how it applies. The next question that becomes, all right, well, then how do you calculate it? And so there's sort of some misconceptions here because the reality is the calculation changes every single year because the two variables that go into calculating that required minimum distribution change every single year. So the variable number one is, of course, the value of the account. Your required minimum distribution is based on the value of your account. So your value of your account, obviously going to fluctuate from one year to the next. So you have to look at the value at year end or January 1. Usually when you're looking at statements, they're generated out on 1231. So it's that value that ultimately you use for the calculation. The other variable in calculating your required minimum distribution is your age, right? And so based upon your age, then you have to go over to the IRS life expectancy tables. And from there, pick your factor based upon your age. And then that life expectancy factor becomes the divisor that you divide into the value of the account. That result then is your required minimum distribution. So that's how much you have to take out during the course of the year. In terms of the frequency or the timing, it doesn't really make a difference except that you've got to take it out before the year ends, before the clock strikes midnight. So you certainly want to make sure that you're dealing with that required minimum distribution. The only exception to that is in the first year, year one, you get to delay it to the next year, but you have to take it out prior to April 1 of that following year. And then again, that only applies in year one. The, the, the issue that we have with that is that means that you're doubling up in that next year. So maybe there's a reason why that's a good thing, right? Uh, but more often than not, it's best to just kind of take it along the way each and every year. Perhaps one of the most common misconceptions or mysteries about the required minimum distribution is, look, if you're retired, right, and, and you're taking income from your investments, as you know, most people do, then you pretty much are going to cover your required minimum distribution. I mean, the required minimum distribution typically starts out at an equivalent withdrawal rate at under 4%, 3.65% to be exact. So if you're like most people that are retired and you're using your investments and using them to generate out monthly income, then at the end of the day, um, you, you're probably going to cover that required minimum distribution. So the required minimum distribution is, as the name suggests, sort of a minimum distribution that at, at the end of the day, um, for the most part, and, and we see it for probably 80, 85% of the time, folks are 
satisfying the required minimum distribution just by virtue of the income that they are using from their investment accounts during the course of retirement, right? Makes sense. So uh, the, the required minimum distribution then is not something that you have to do on top of that. It is simply satisfied by virtue of what you're taking out for income from your various account. So some important things to know about required minimum distributions. Hopefully that helps to explain it a little bit more in terms of the perspective on them. So we're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk about your credit. How do you, how to improve your credit score coming up next here on dollars and cents with Joel Garris of Nelson financial planning. We're going to talk about this segment of dollars and cents. We're going to talk about credit and your credit score. Because it's pretty important because that credit score ultimately determines a lot of different things that can ultimately increase the cost of what you pay for things. So we're going to give you some things to be thinking about on this segment of the program. A lot of the information that we'll talk about is described in much more detail in Chapter 6 of our new book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents. If you're regular listeners of the program, you know that last year year we sat down we wrote this book it had been 25 years in the making and the book itself really does provide a range of essential tools and strategies to help you learn and organize and ultimately achieve financial success and certainly uh, credit and your credit score is is pretty important to achieving financial success. Interestingly, side note on the book itself, Next Gen Dollars and Cents, it is in fact climbing the Amazon charts, if you will, recently broke into the top 100 for our category. So that's exciting stuff. It is, of course, available on Amazon Prime. Uh, I think they uh, the folks at Amazon are pricing it at $14.99. Here's a little secret and it's certainly something that we've shared with our listening audience before but pretty sure if you come into the office and kind of sit down and schedule one of our free conversations the folks out front jamie carolyn they're pretty good about you know kind of slipping you a free copy so another good incentive for coming in for that conversation, that review, that portfolio check, that second opinion uh, to schedule that with Nelson Financial Planning is at the end of the day, you also wind up getting the book and you don't have to pay Amazon's prices. And we all know Amazon's a pretty profitable company. So, you know, there's a way around that where you could get the book for absolutely free by coming in to the office. Anyway, we certainly appreciate all of the support of the folks that uh, have purchased the book on Amazon. We've also had some great reviews as well. So we want to take a minute and thank folks as well for that. This, of course, is the radio program, uh, Dollars and Cents, uh, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. My name, of course, is Joel Garris, Certified Financial Planner, Certified Financial Fiduciary at Nelson Financial planning. So credit, at the end of the day, it is simply your ability to obtain something before it's fully paid for based on, for lack of a better word, the trust that you're going to make those required payments that are going to be due in the future. I mean, that's the heart of what credit is. I'm going to give you money because I trust you that you're going to ultimately pay me back. The very relationship of credit is based on trust. Well, how do you measure trust? Well, you know, hopefully with your family, you can measure it relatively easily. But if you're a lending institution and some random Joe Smith walks up, how do you measure that, right? Well, that gets directly to the credit score, right? So the credit score then is a numerical representation of your personal trustworthiness or credit worthiness. And that's how ultimately the lenders determine whether they can trust you to make the payments that are going to be required. So let's set the stage by sort of understanding some of the different types of credit that is available out there. So uh, there's generally three that we talk about in the book. Uh, there's revolving credit, which uh, sort of allows you to borrow up uh, to a specific amount of, 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 of limit. 
uh, generally that's like a credit card, right? Uh, installment credit would be borrowing a specific amount of money and having a specific payment over the course of a specific time. So that's kind of like a mortgage or a car loan. And then open credit would be like a debit or a charge card where typically you're supposed to be paying the balance. You don't necessarily have a preset limit, but you're supposed to be paying the balance off each and every month. So those are kind of the three main types of credit that are available out there. Obviously, having good credit, there's a lot of different benefits, right? You get lower interest rates when you do borrow money. You get easier loan approvals, right? Because you're more trustworthy. And so it's easier to get a loan approved. Uh, you may be entrusted to borrow more money, have a higher credit limit than what you might otherwise be able to get. Uh, even insurance companies, auto home, auto insurance, home insurance, they'll, they'll kind of pull a credit profile, maybe not a credit report in terms of the actual score, but they'll pull a credit profile. And from there, that could impact how much you're paying for premiums. Uh, same thing on the employment front. Uh, employers obviously don't pull credit scores per se, but they may decide to pull some kind of a profile on you as well. So certainly some great ways in which, uh, you know, it's great benefits, if you will, for having good credit. So probably understand all of that. The thing that might be a little bit more of a mystery is what goes into that credit score. If the credit score is a personal reflection of my trustworthiness as a borrower, what actually goes into it? Well, it's five different pieces that generally go into it. And the book, Next Gen Dollars and Cents, Chapter 6, actually has a little sort of pie chart, if you will, that really helps to break this down. But basically, those five components, the biggest of which is your payment history, right? 35% of your credit score comes from that. Simply put, you got to pay your bills on time, right? If you don't pay your bills on time, it's not going to help your credit score. Credit utilization is in the next biggest category. It amounts to about 30% of your credit score. That's the notion of the amount of, the amount of credit that you are using at any given point in time relative to the amount of credit that you have available, right? So that's kind of the credit utilization. How much could I borrow and how much am I actually borrowing? Kind of want to keep that number to about 30%. So let's say you could borrow up to $50,000. Uh, you kind of want to keep that level at 15000 If you keep bumping up to like forty five. dollars well, then you're utilizing your credit a little bit much. That's going to negatively impact your credit score. Uh, the third category, which represents about 15% of that credit score calculation, is just simply your length of credit history. They want to Lenders want to know that you've had loans outstanding for an extended period of time. More importantly, that you've been paying them on time, right? So if you can prove to somebody, hey, wait a minute. I had this loan for 20 years and I made payments every single month on time. Well, then that's going to boost up your credit score. Types of credit used usually amounts to about 10%. Um, you know, the kind of the credit makeup are using a bunch of credit cards, you're using a bunch of, you know, mortgages, what, what makes that up? And then the last category, which makes up uh, another sort of 10% of that credit score is uh, how many times you've been applying for credit, right? If you're applying for credit a bunch of times, kind of makes you look like you might be less trustworthy because well, why do you need a bunch of credit all at once that you're going through this process of ultimately applying for a bunch of different credits. So that's the pieces that make up the, the credit score. General ranges, you know, if you're 500 or below, that's not, that's, well, it's not very good. It's terrible. Uh, um, you know, you start to get, you know, better credit and sort of 650 to 750, very good credit is sort of 750 and above. And then of course, excellent is 800 and above. So two important takeaways that, that you really need to know when you're thinking about your credit score. It's really know where you fit on the scale, right? What is your actual credit score? Where do you kind of fall on the range? And um, to make sure to review your credit report, because there could be errors on it. There could be misrepresentations on it that you need to shoot. You could even have some identity theft going on on it. So you need to take a look at the credit report to make sure that you're monitoring that. But those are the kinds of things to, to be thinking about. Make sure you're paying the bills on time. Keep that credit utilization low. Monitor the credit reports. Try not to open up too many accounts. All of those kinds of things will help you improve your credit score which ultimately will save you 
money. With that, we're going to wrap it on up and get on out of here of this week's episode of Dollars and Cents. If you like what you heard and want to learn more, please visit our website at Nelson Financial Planning, or you can even call the office 407-629-6477. If you do that during business hours, you'll get the opportunity to talk to a live human being, and we'll be happy to sit down with you and give you our opinion of where you are at in terms of your retirement journey. With that, we're going to get on out of here. This has been Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning on Dollars and Cents. Have a great rest of your day.